Welcome to the Real News Network. Good to have you all with us once again, folks. I'm Mark Steiner. Always a pleasure to talk with you. And uh, one of my things I love doing more than anything else is talking to people who write and think and think about what they write before they write it. There's a book that came through the pipe that I really liked. It's called The Next Republic, uh, The Rise of a New Political Majority by D.D. Guttenplan, who is the editor-at-large at The Nation. Uh, this is the book. And it's really a fascinating historical analysis, along with stories about what's happening in today's world and how they connect. Uh, and uh, Didi has been writing for Didi Golden Plan has been writing for the Nation for a long time. Before that, for the New Yorker, Village Voice, many other places, produced audio documentaries uh, as all-around media man on the left. And I'm good to have you in the studio. Great to be here, Mark. The next republic. So as far as you see, we've had in America. Three republics before. That's right. This I mean, is a, this so is always this a little bit arbitrary, right. but um, I suppose. So the book is partly about what would it be like if we had a government that felt like it really belonged to us, that acted for our interests as as a people, and that was not the tool of corporations or the rich or s special economic interests. And and has this ever happened, or has it come close to happening? And so, in thinking about it, you think, well, what was it? that the people in 1776 thought they were fighting for? Were they, were they just fighting to get rid of the king, or were they fighting for a whole different political order? And if they were fighting for a different political order, what would that have looked like? And so that's one republic, which for the purposes of the book I call the Whiskey Republic. And we'll, we'll get into why I, I call it the Whiskey Republic, but it, it doesn't, it's not because you could drink it. <laughs> um, <laughs> although perhaps you could say it's because they could almost taste the right. freedom that they ended up not quite getting. Uh, the next republic is I call the Lincoln Republic, and that for me is a little more, almost a little more personal because I live part of the year in Vermont, and um, Vermont's the only state where slavery was never legal, uh, and it also is the state that had the highest percentage of enlistment in the Civil War uh, as volunteers, and so part of what I was thinking about is what is it that motivated a Vermont farm boy who'd probably never seen a slave to enlist and stay and fight in the Union Army. What did, what did those people think they were fighting for? I mean, yes, they were fighting for the Union, and yes, eventually they came to realize that they were fighting to destroy slavery. But it wasn't so much actual slavery, because they, as I said, they never met a slave. They were fighting to destroy the slave power, so this, this vast economic interest that had its hands on the American government and that they came to feel had its hands around their necks even though, again, you know, they were very far removed from racial slavery. So it's about that, which I call the Lincoln Republic. And in a way, that's the republic that, if Reconstruction had been fully carried out, would have come into being, but wasn't carried out because Reconstruction was thwarted and eventually sold out or abandoned, depending on how critical you want to be about it. I guess I would say sold out. Mm -hmm. uh, right. And then the third republic I write about is the Roosevelt Republic. And that came to me during the course of my reporting on the 2016 presidential campaign, where I'd be, I spent a lot of time in Ohio, as you do if you're covering a political campaign, because Ohio is such a crucial state. And as I would be reporting in Ohio, I'd be, for example, in Cincinnati, and I'd see these fantastic columns, uh, like classical Greek columns, standing alone in a park. And I'd say, what is that? And they'd say, well, that's, those are the pieces of, of Daniel Burnham's design for Union Station. The, the rest of the station's been demolished, but we kept the columns. Or I'd be in Akron, and I'd see this incredible federal office building taking up a whole block, and you go inside, and there are these great WPA murals. Or I'd be in Cleveland, and you go to the Cleveland Public Library, and there are these murals depicting the building of the bridge across the Ohio River. And and as I was traveling around Ohio, I realized that these were coming to feel like the scene in Planet of the Apes, where the Statue of Liberty is <laughs> on the beach, you know, and you see, and you think, what was this <laughs> great alien civilization whose, whose relics I keep tripping over in Ohio? And this great, rel this great alien civilization was the New Deal. It was the WPA. It was the belief that government had a, an obligation to put people to work in productive ways and, and to look after the American people. It was the, you know, it was the, it was the civilization that gave us social security. Uh, and it was the civilization that gave us the Civilian Conservation Corps and the, and the civilization that gave us unemployment insurance. 
and it was the civilization that, in a sense, started to unravel in the 1960s and was destroyed by Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. But, you know, part of what I was trying to understand in Ohio and why I kept returning to the state after the election to places like Youngstown and Warren, um, where, you know, there, we used to make things and we don't make things anymore, and where there are lots of people who used to make things and don't make things anymore, is that you meet a lot of people who feel that something was taken from them. And in a sense, that was, to me, part of Trump's appeal to these people, is he would, he would tell people, somebody took something from you. Of course, he'd, he'd, he'd lie to them. It was a con. You know, he would, he would pretend that what was taken to you, what was taken from you was the, the privilege of being a white man in a white man's world. Um, but these people were not wrong to feel that something had been taken from them. And what had been taken from them, in my view, was the Roosevelt Republic. And that's, that's the thing that we lost. So, so the book is partly about where were the periods in American history where it felt like, to use Lincoln's phrase that you really can't improve on, we had a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. And, and where might that be, you know, if this, if this thing kind of submerges and rises and submerges and rises in the way that the people submerge and rise, when might it be rising again? How might it rise again? And I suppose the thing that gave me an intimation that it might be rising again, because you don't always, success is not always its own harbinger. Sometimes failure is the harbinger of success. And so for me, the harbinger of the next republic was the Sanders campaign. And this, both this incredible outpouring of radical energy, but also the sense of astonishment that I first noticed in a, on a, in a high school gym in New Hampshire on the night that Bernie won the New Hampshire primary looking around the gym and seeing all these people looking around at each other and realizing that for us the surprise wasn't that Bernie won New Hampshire. The surprise was that there were so many of us because we had been told for so long, so relentlessly by all of the mainstream media that we were marginal, that, you know, that, that people who were liberal were kind of odious and to be ashamed. And, and those of us who were to the left of liberals, we were completely marginal and written out of the American story. And yet, here we were, we, we filled this high school gym, we'd carried a state, and at that, on that night at least, it, it looked like anything was possible. And although it turned out that anything wasn't possible at that moment, um, I thought, wow, what, what would it be like to imagine what all of these people are actually fighting for could happen? So I, I want to talk a bit about the Republics and then come to talk about some of the people that you write about here and how what they may be harbingers of, and also what those periods tell us that we need to watch out for. Mm -hmm. um, but let me start here, because the, you, I, I said two republics, and because there were three, because you wrote about the Whiskey Rebellion in the, in the, earlier in the book, in, in the book. Um, but I never thought of the Whiskey Rebellion, as, Whiskey Rebellion as being a republic, because it was, seemed to me to be such a short-lived rebellion against the new American government over taxation and other things that they were fighting for, um, but you include that in the republics. Well, I'll tell you why, yeah, for, yeah, for two so. reasons. Okay, so first, because um, we, in high school, we learned that the American Revolution was about, you know, f taxation without representation right. and, and getting rid of the king. But it turned out that when they were making the revolution, it was also about economic inequality and economic equality that you had the Pennsylvania Constitution, which was written in 1776 and was the most radical constitution of all the colonial constitutions. And it had a one-house one legislature because uh, in every legislature that exists where there's an upper house, the upper house very quickly becomes the house of privilege and right. financial privilege. Right. Um, but also there was, a, there was a lot of debate then. I mean, they were overturning a social order. So they didn't, nobody told them you have to stop here. You know, they were, they were experimenting with things like a limit on how much land anybody could own or whether you could be an absentee landlord and collect rent on land that you didn't cultivate. And there was a lot of sentiment against that. And the force that eventually dominated was the force represented, ironically, by Alexander Hamilton, who, you know, has now become, thanks to Lin-Manuel Miranda, a folk <laughs> hero. Uh, but he was, the, he was the voice of privilege. He right. said, we have, to, we have to have a country where the rich can get richer in order to have a secure foundation. And he won out. But, see, and this is the thing about success and failure and harbingers in history. The Whiskey Rebellion happened in western Pennsylvania because 
they had no way of getting the grain they grew to market. There was no Erie Canal, there were no roads. So what they would do is they would distill the grain into whiskey, which A, wouldn't spoil, and B, instead of needing six mules to get over the Alleghenies, you could get over in, in casks in one mule. Okay, and Hamilton imposed this tax on whiskey, uh, which was rigged in favor of the big producers who could pay and get a discount by paying in advance, because they were rich enough to pay in advance. And if you did big volume, you got discounts for that. So the, the whole thing was, was rigged to favor the 1% of 1780s. Uh, and these farmers assembled in this field to fight it. Now, the, a couple of things that were interesting about that. One is that the field that they assembled in is literally across the street from where John Fetterman, this guy who was then running for, can for Senate in Pennsylvania and is now running for deputy. Who's the mayor? He's the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, right. which is a kind of... Um, deeply distressed former, it's, you, to call it a suburb completely paints the wrong picture. And it's I a majority African-American community. Exactly. In, in, in the district, Just if, outside of Pittsburgh. And to describe him for people who don't know John Fetterman and they can see his picture. He's six foot eight and as he says he looks more like, like a, a wrestler. professional wrestler than a politician. <laughs> right. He's got p tattoos on both arms right. and, a, and a goatee go and a team. shaved head. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who's running for lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania, which I love. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. In the summer of 2016, I went to see John, and he took me on the tour of the Mon Valley to hollowed out town after hollowed out town. And he had just found out that day that Barack Obama was going to endorse his opponent running for the Democratic nomination for senator in Pennsylvania. So he was very bummed out. But we would go to these towns where there had once been thriving industry and where now there was nothing but essentially Oxycontin. And at the end of the day, John explained to me why Hillary Clinton was going to lose Pennsylvania. And I thought he was, it was just sour grapes, you know. Mm -hmm. But it turned out that he called it exactly right, that she lost the state by 68,000 votes, and that in these two counties, Westmoreland County and Washington County, which were the center of the Whiskey Rebellion, she lost by 80,000 votes. In other words, more than her margin in the whole state. So I guess one way I would put it is you can't screw people and expect it to just go away. It, it sticks around. So I want to come back to that point because I think it's a really important point. I was thinking about some of the stuff you said in parts of the book, <clears throat> talking about what happened in Nebraska and what happened in Pennsylvania. But then when you also when you wrote about Chakwe Lumumba, the mayor of mm -hmm. Jackson, Mississippi, and, and, and how we put these ideas together and how they fit, because you also write a lot about how uh, blacks and whites came together in different portions of our struggle in America for, for, for this country, whether it was the Civil War or the Union Movement in the 30s. So I'm going to come to that in a moment, all right? But, but let me just talk about these republics you, you, you really mm -hmm. focus in on and how they relate to some of the people in the book and where they take us. So, it, but part of what you write about, um, it's interesting about both republics, the Lincoln Republic and the Roosevelt Republic, as right. you write about, as part of what they both did, they increased taxes. Mm -hmm. um, and they paid for things that wouldn't ordinarily be paid for, exactly. especially the Rooseveltian Republic. Uh, but the first real taxes in America came under Lincoln. To pay for the Civil War. Pay for the war. And they printed money. And they printed money. Greenbacks. Right? Greenbacks. So, so this is an interesting dynamic to me that makes the publics attached in some ways about these were periods of taxation that hadn't happened before. And Roosevelt comes in and taxes the rich and taxes wealth after that in ways that never been Not happened Not just before. income, exactly, but wealth. Wealth, right? So talk a bit about those connections, about what these, how that fits into the definition of the republics as you see them. And sure. what it might mean for now. Well, I mean, so we've had periods in our history where the federal government has had to step up and do things. You know, they had to fight the Civil War. And that meant paying for the war, paying for the army, paying for things like building railroads, uh, and that meant massive appropriation and taxes and expropriation of wealth. And the other thing that's interesting to consider if you're looking at the Lincoln Republic is that the biggest asset class in the, in the country in the 19th century, in other words, the largest single area of wealth in the country was represented by the bodies of slaves, of enslaved people. In, in 1860 dollars, that was over $3 billion. And in England, for example, where they had slavery, when they abolished slavery, they compensated the slave owners. Right. David Cameron, who was recently conservative prime minister, his ancestors got millions and millions of dollars in 
compensation for their slaves, okay? What Lincoln did in freeing the slaves was expropriate the largest asset class in American history and then liquidate it without any compensation. So it's the single most radical economic act in American history. If you could imagine in today's terms, if the government, the Sanders, Warren, whatever administration you want to call it, <laughs> took over the 10 biggest oil companies because they're poisoning our air and our water. And they, said, and they said, well, we can't let this happen anymore, so we're going to take over these companies and we're going to liquidate them. And we're not going to pay the shareholders anything. That's almost as radical as what happened in the Civil War. So part of the reason that the history is in my book is because when people say it can't be done, that's much too radical. It's only because we've forgotten what we've already done. And so the history in my book is to remind people what we Americans have been capable of in the past. So, so one of the great quotes in the book has to do with labor, some labor coming together uh, around fighting uh, slavery. Mm -hmm. And they refer to the lords of the loom and the lords of the lash. They were going after both of them. That's right. Um, and so there have been attempts like that in the Civil War. You read about attempts like that during uh, the period of the Depression and where unions were really picking up The popular up front period of the popular front period where blacks and whites and, other, and, and a broad spectrum of people were coming together to fight for something. Well, that's so. Right? That's right. And I guess, for me, there are two things that are essential about that. One is that we've done it before, so it's clearly possible. And the other is to, to notice that after the Civil War, in the Civil War, you had all these northern industrialists who were Republicans. They were the economic backbone of the Republican Party. And they were opposed to slavery. But they were not the leaders in the abolitionist movement. The leaders in the abolitionist movement were free blacks. Uh, and, you know, free blacks and religious whites who ob objected to slavery on religious grounds. But mainly free blacks. They were the, they were the militants of the abolitionist movement. And you know, gradually they began to attract other kinds of support and they created a coalition and they founded the Republican Party and they, they changed American politics and then the slave power attacked them and that started an open civil war. But after the Civil War, the question was, do you have this newly enfranchised proletariat in the South, former slaves, and in the North you have all of these working men who'd picked up a gun and fought for a republic. And now they had this taste of an egalitarian society. And one of the things that happened right after the Civil War was that the state of Illinois passed a, a, a limit on working hours, an eight-hour day law. And the New York, uh, sorry, the, when the state of Illinois passed an eight-hour day law, the foreign correspondent for the Herald Tribune, a German writer named Karl Marx, said that the eight-hour day law represented the first fruits of the Civil War. There was suddenly all this agitation on the part of working people. That terrified the industrialists who had bankrolled the Republican Party. And they backed away from the sort of radical agitation that re was, was represented by Reconstruction and ma essentially made a deal to stop Reconstruction. But I suppose, and then in the 30s, right. you had black and white unionists fighting and striking alongside each other. But you also had a coalition, Roosevelt's political coalition, that was dependent on white supremacy because the Southern Democrats were committed to white supremacy. And that both limited what Roosevelt could do, and eventually that was the wedge that broke the New Deal coalition. So if you look at the, those periods, and we're going to come back to talking about these folks that you talk about now and how this fits into all this. If you look at those periods and you realize that what you call liberal Republicans then and Southern Democrats coming together to kill Reconstruction, which they did, put Hayes in power right. as president, even though he didn't win the majority of the vote. And then you look at what happened after Roosevelt's death when it continued, but then coming together through the loyalty... The, the, the loyalty oaths the, the, and the red baiting and Taft-Hartley, all And those all those things, things that happened, Taft-Hartley was defeated because Southern Senators defeated it um, and, and helped to try to kill labor and take labor's power away. So what does that say about where we are now? So what, we're clearly not in a fourth republic. We're not there. People are fighting for it. We don't even know we're fighting for it in some ways, but we are. Uh, and and that we also have this opposition, because you have, you know, one of the things, you, you Chakwe Lumumba, who you interview in Jackson, Mississippi, talks about the power of race. And this is a great quote. Let me just read this in the mm -hmm. context of where we are now and what happened in the past. So. 
if you if you if you if you look at this, and I, this is in, incredible stuff that I think Jacque said uh, in your book that really needs to be shared. Um, he writes uh, this is after he talks about the election of Trump, and he says on Wednesday afternoon after the election, I woke up in Mississippi. Uh, no matter whether Trump, uh, Donald Trump is president or Barack Obama is the president, we've always been at the bottom. And then writes, the United States is infected with a disease called racism. The anti-racism movement has some seminal victories, but you have a racist movement that is fighting at the same time. We win something, they don't go home and say, we, oh, we lost, go to sleep, so we can't rest. So, in That's some right. ways, he describes where we are. He's the contradictions were facing. Well, this is why I wanted to go to Mississippi because you know you can tell yourself fairy stories all the time. And, and you, you, very clearly, the beginning of the book, you were not did not want to write about a fairy tale. You had to deal with the reality. Right. No, I, my 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 mantra in writing this book is no more wishful thinking. Exactly. You know, right, right. a lot of us floated through the Obama years thinking that you know America's racial struggles were over, and that was clearly baloney. It was baloney. Uh, I never floated on that. Book. <laughs> no, well, right. you know, I, I, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not fessing up one way or another on that question. <laughs> All I'm saying is that a lot of people did. Right. Uh, and, you know, as Antar, Chakwe Antar Lumumba, because his father was also Chakwe Lumumba, so right. uh, p his friends call him Antar to distinguish him from his father anyway. As he says, you know, I woke up in Mississippi, so for me, it didn't make any difference, or it didn't make, it didn't make the kind of difference that the rest of you all thought it did. Um, but it's also important for another reason, which is, you know, if you spend time on the left in America, there are a lot of guys who look like me and, frankly, you, uh, who are always saying... <laughs> oh, yeah. What do you mean by that, sir? <laughs> well, wh white men of a certain age. Yeah, I got you. Who are right. saying, uh, <laughs> you know, enough with race, enough with gender. You know, stop talking about your identity All politics. Right. Right. You guys are distracting from what the only thing that really matters which is class and if you would just stop banging on about race and gender and whatever else we could put together a class politics that would that would be a, a formula for victory and you know that's just pardon my french bullshit yes and so uh and you know what it's only old white men who ever have that illusion because women and black people and gay people know better and we should also <laughs> let me add to that group that one of the differences now from before is that never before in history, I think, have we had the percentage of white Americans who see race and racism as a bottom line issue in America that is part of what's tearing us apart and killing us. Well, I think that's right. And that's, that's, that's the difference between today and 1960 and 1860. Well, that's right, and between today and 1930. And so, so in a way, the structure of the book is that you have these historical episodes to show that there is this rhythm in American life and there are these possibilities of things that we've achieved before and tried to do and could still do. But the present tense chapters, the profiles of people like Antar Lumumba, like Jane McAlevey, the labor organizer, like Jane Kleb, the environmental campaigner and now head of the Democratic Party in Nebraska, like Carlos Ramirez Rosa, the uh, alderman, alderman from Chicago. Chicago. Um, it's to say that well there's something that Jane McAlevey says that I just think is great which is she said uh, if you if you don't fight for a majority then you surrender the only the only real weapon that working people have ever had which is our numbers you know in in England the slogan of the Labor Party now is for the many not the few and in a sense that's at the root of the politics that this book is about that you have to assemble a majority and, and if you're committed to democracy with a small d as I am the big D democracy, the party is a whole other question, but right, you come into democracy right, right. with a small D, then the only way you can change things is through assembling a majority. And you cannot assemble a majority and ignore race. You cannot assemble a majority and ignore the rights of immigrants. You cannot assemble a majority and ignore the struggles of workers. So that we, we have to find a way for all of these movements which are in revolt, to speak to each other, work to each other, work together, and recognize and be in solidarity with each other, and in a sense, that's the plea of the book. So I'm curious when you look at the people you talk, talked about in this book, um, Klebe, who organized, who came out of this Republican family, approached a, a anti-choice Republican mm -hmm. family, built the Cowboy Indian Coalition to fight the Keystone Pipeline, became the head of the Democratic Party in Nebraska, uh, in, in, in Chicago, um, a gay Puerto Rican Mexican man who is one of the leaders of the progressive movement in Chicago now in the Latino community, Chakwe Lumumba, 
uh, McAlevey, all the, the people, an incredible union organizer. So what do we learn from them in terms of where this movement is going? We don't have a party that encompasses everybody. There's no popular front that brings everybody together in one place, like the 30s had for a while until the Communist mm -hmm. Party and the Soviet Union killed it. <laughs> we don't have that. So, so what do we have? What, what, what is this lesson from history telling us that you write about in the context of the people you write about who are very much at the forefront of the struggle in their states? Well, there's a person you haven't mentioned who's also, I think, critical to this, and sh she's the last chapter in the book, Zephyr oh, oh, Teachout. Oh, Zephyr Teachout. Right, uh, right, who right, just right, lost right. her race for attorney general for New York State. Uh, but who is definitely not going away. She's the lead claim. She's the lead plaintiff on the lawsuit uh, about the emoluments clause, tr saying that cl that Trump has been taking corrupt payments from foreign governments. Uh, and the reason that that matters is because if you ignore corruption, as anybody who's ever lived in a city run by a democratic machine can tell you, if you ignore corruption, Chicago, Baltimore, New York, <laughs> pick your city, <laughs> you, right? <laughs> then then you're ignoring a crucial piece of this. So, so part of it is, and the, the other thing is that I quote Dan Cantor, who's one of the founders of the Working Families Party in New York, right. who says, if you try to occupy the Democratic Party, the Democratic Party ends up occupying you. Now, Dan is not someone who, who has ever turned his back on the Democratic Party. He's not someone who says, oh, we should all go, you know, leave and vote green. It's not that. But it's that don't think that the Democratic Party is going to solve it for you. You know, don't think you can turn your back on the Democratic Party in a tight corner and expect it to do the right thing, because it won't unless we make it. So, and I suppose that's where we are now. Where we are now is we have this potential vehicle. And I think, you know, it's interesting that in Nebraska, the anti-Keystone people have taken over the Democratic that's Party. That's really fascinating. You know, right. and, and in New York, suddenly Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, you know, is becoming somebody who people are coalescing around. I mean, there's a lot of grassroots stuff. I guess my, the thing I learned in reporting the book is you've got to pay attention to the grassroots. You can't look at it. You know, even though it was great to see Bernie running, it's not going to happen from the top down. It's going to happen from the ground up. So, so, you, so my, my big question was after you finished writing this book and, and, you, and you interviewed Zephyr Teachout after she had lost the election for governor mm -hmm. um, in the primary yeah. to Cuomo, and now she's lost again, but she's still in there fighting and being part of this. Um, but if you look at what happened in the, which is not necessarily in your book, but you look at what happened 68 to 72 in the United States, mm -hmm. and a lot of the people who were active in the anti-war movement, in the black liberation movement, other places, women's movement, ended up inside the Democratic Party. And this is kind of radical wing, 1972, McGovern running for mm -hmm. president, all the rest. And so they ended up actually becoming, in many ways, the establishment of the party, run by the, the corporate Democrats and got sucked into the machine, willingly or unwillingly sucked into the machine. And I look at what's going on now and seeing the revolt taking place on, in America, a lot of it taking place inside the Democratic Party, people running in this election. We'll see what happens in a few weeks in November. But a really powerful group of people from the left of every race in America, all genders, running for a different kind of America, running for a different kind of republic. Mm -hmm. So there are real danger signs, though, in terms of what that could mean. It could mean it could mean a new republic. It could mean people getting sucked back into it as well. Well, you know, it's so. I guess one of the things you learn if you spend any time in politics is you have to always pay attention to who's zooming who. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so right. uh, if you and I think part of what happened in the '70s is people got elected, they got invited to the party, and they thought, oh, you know, I'm, I'm invited to the party. I'm a guest now. It's all it's our party, and it was never their party. And I think that's, in a sense, that's why the Zephyr Teachout piece is so crucial, because as long as it's corporate money funding the Democratic Party, then it's always going to be the corporation's party and not ours. And, you know, that's why suddenly you see all these candidates running and saying, I don't take corporate money, and that's a thing. You know, I think that's great that that's a thing. We need more of that. Um, but, you know, it's also not just about elections. Right. It, and that's, again, that's why I begin with Jane McAlevey. You know, it's, it's about unions. It's about organizing where you work. It's about making sure that the people you do business with belong to unions. It's about, you know, when you, if you're in a position to be a buyer from a company saying, you know, do, are your workers unionized? Uh, you know, it's about solidarity at a very basic level, you know, not passing by if somebody's on a picket line. So, you know, uh, and for that matter, you know, where you buy your books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so I don't want to say more than that right now, but you know, <laughs> if you got ears here. Uh.
<laughs> well, this has been great. Uh, Don Gutenplan, thank you so much for, for coming by. Great to talk to you, Mark. Don Gutenplan is an editor at large at for large. Nation Magazine uh, between Vermont and uh, London. The book is The Next Republic, The Rise of a New Radical Majority. It's really a good book. And I must say, it's always a pleasure to read a book that is well-written. Somebody knows how to write and brings its history and present together to wrestle with where the future is going. Uh, and Don, great to have you in town here in Baltimore, and thanks for the book. Great to be here. Thanks, Mark. So catch the book, folks, The Next Republic by Dee Dee Guttenplan. It's well worth the read, bringing history and life together and our present struggle. So pick it up at a store, if you can. That would be the best. And I'm Mark Steiner here for The Real News Network. Thank you so much for joining us. Take care.